Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. I will come back. Now the words of Jesus. Now, today, many people are looking for other places to live. Isn't that true? Scientists have been telling us, actually, for a long time, that we need to get off this planet. True? <laughs> that's what scientists are saying. You know, um, Hawkins, the one that died some time ago, that's, that was his thing. You know, we've got about 50 years. I think he said 100 years to get off the planet. Then he was saying 50 years. Uh, and today we see, you know, the billionaires like SpaceX uh, and, uh, and others. You know, there's, there's a race for space dominance, uh, obviously for military purposes, but also... Uh, you know, they think it's for our survival. We need to, you know, they say, you know, this planet's going down. We need another place to live. And so today there are 70 countries in the world that are, have active space programs. 70 countries. Uh, 20 of those countries have budgets over $100 million. And I imagine there's a handful of countries that are run into the billions, I suppose. But it seems that the private sector is uh, almost ahead of the game these days, isn't it? Uh, with, with the billionaires uh, doing what they're doing. Now, you would have seen um, <clears throat> over a week ago now how uh, India landed on the moon, August 23, Wednesday, week ago. And, uh, you know, they're part of the, the space race now too. And they've landed in a part of the moon where nobody's ever landed before. They've landed on the South Pole of the moon because supposedly um, there is water there. And so they think, well, if there's water there, maybe we can live there. Uh, anyone want to live on the moon? <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and then you've got this uh, International Space Station, and I guess the purpose of the space station is to, you know, develop technology in terms of space, uh, etc. But also, you know, part of it is learning how to survive out there. And, uh, and also, I guess, the exploration, etc. you know, they, they're looking for additional resources because they, you know, they're saying, well, we're going to run out of resources on planet Earth. We need other places to find resources like, um, I guess, uh, meteorites, asteroids and the moon and other places. So uh, there's 15 countries now that are involved in this International Space Station. So, the question is, do we actually need another place to live? The answer is, well, God's already got a plan, hasn't he? God's already shared the plan. And uh, Elena, in her reading this, uh, this morning from uh, John chapter 14, has told us what Jesus himself has said. This is the biblical position. Jesus said in John 14, verse 3, I will come back. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, let me ask you a question then. If, um, if that's the biblical position, and uh, if you were the devil, would you want to confuse that position? Hmm? If, if you wanted to come up with a strategy to, to, to counter what Jesus has said, what the Bible says, you would want to have people as confused as possible. Isn't that true? So the adversary has done very well at creating confusion and causing people to believe all sorts of other things. And I want to go today to a few different, um, a few different faiths, if you like, and see what people out there are believing because... Pretty much every faith out there is expecting somebody to come. We're waiting for Jesus to come back, right? But every faith out there is waiting for someone. If we look at the Hindus, they're waiting for the 10th avatar called Kalki. Uh, and uh, this is prophesied in the final incarnation of, of Vishnu. And it is believed that this is some sort of, you know, a superior power that comes to destroy wicked, wickedness. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? 
It brings an end to a dark, destructive period, and guess what? It ushers in uh, a new age of righteousness. So the Hindu friends that we have, they're waiting for the 10th avatar, all right? Um, if you look at our Buddhist friends, they're waiting for a future Buddha called the Maitreya, currently believed to be residing in heaven, but can be reached through meditation. Uh, and they believe that the, the Maitreya will descend and be born as a human to teach a new law. And this will bring full enlightenment. I identified, uh, as I was reading up on this, this Maitreya, this future Buddha, will be identified by his sacred flask of water and his hairstyle. You think that might be difficult to copy? I mean, I think there might be a few false Maitreyas even, right? What do our Muslim friends believe? So in Islam, they believe in the coming of the 12th Imam or also known as the Mehdi. Uh, now, Mehdi is like this awaited um, end-time saviour, leader, an eschatological leader. You know, the, the Muslims have a real strong interest in the area of eschatology and end-time events. And uh, actually, one time, um, a friend of mine was sharing with me how when he was at Newbold College, uh, our, our basically our uh, college of higher education in England, um, they had a delegation of about three or four Muslims come from another country and they came because they wanted to talk to the Seventh-day Adventists about what we believed about the second coming of Jesus. Uh, because they believe that Jesus is coming back too. Um, <clears throat> but these guys, all four of them, they were doing PhDs on the topic of the second coming of Jesus. So they wanted to talk to the Adventists to see what they had to say. So they have a real interest in this area, but they also they believe that this Mehdi will, um, will come shortly before the coming of Jesus, and uh, he will come to kill the false messiah. Now this Mehdi is, uh, is believed to be a direct descendant of Muhammad, and um, basically is waiting for his arrival, awaiting for humanity to be ready for him to come. He's waiting for us to be ready intellectually and spiritually for the message, supposedly, that he will have. And he comes to fill the earth with harmony and justice. Interesting how there's a common thread here, isn't there? Can you see that? You know, coming in to bring peace, harmony, justice, righteousness, a new age, new law, da-da-da. Um, our Jewish friends... Um, well, they're still waiting for the Mashiach, right? And um, it's associated that um, uh, our Jewish friends believe that um, it will be associated with the rebuilding of the temple and a return to the homeland, etc., bring an end to war and usher in an age of peace again. And uh, the Mashiach will bring a knowledge of God to the, to the whole earth. And uh, Messiah, of course, means the anointed one, doesn't it? So this anointed one, the Mashiach, is believed to restore all the glories of, of the times past of, you know, how uh, Israel, of course, had its glory day during uh, the time of King David and King Solomon, etc. So that's what our Jewish friends believe. Then you have the Taoists. Uh, now, I didn't know this. Uh, as I was doing the research, I found that they're expecting an individual called the Li Hong. And uh, Taoists actually don't believe in God as such that God created um, the universe, you know, that God is the creator. However, this Li Hong figure was somebody, an actual person that lived in the first century BC in the time of the Han Dynasty. And it's a figure that keeps cropping up. It's a figure that's even caused some wars amongst the Chinese people. Um, he's a, uh, a saviour figure that reappears, is believed to reappear again at the end of the world or at the end of what they call the world cycle. And comes to, um, he comes to reset, if you like, heaven and earth at a time of chaos and upheaval. Do we have a bit of that going on today in the world? A bit of 
chaos and upheaval. And then, of course, he comes to rescue the chosen people who practice certain incantations and uh, magic symbols, etc. Uh, here in the West, of course, we've got more and more people saying, you know, we have no faith, right? No religion. Um, but essentially, they believe in faith and science, don't they? Technology. Um, essentially, if you're an atheist, you believe, well, once life is over, that's it. It's a full stop. You know, I'm food for worms after that. Uh, there's no afterlife, etc. However, uh, many today, more and more so, are getting frozen when they die. Have you heard of that? Yeah, the cryogenic uh, freezing with the nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, etc. And apparently Australia is uh, one of the cheapest places in the world to get frozen. <laughs> it's only about $100,000 here in Australia. Other places, like if you get frozen in Switzerland, apparently it's about $250,000. But you know, I would think it'd be cheaper there because they've got all that snow, right? But anyway... <laughs> it's easier to get the temperature down, I would have thought. Anyway, um, so, I mean, it's a speculative sort of process because, um, you know, the scientists are saying, well, you know, there's certain tissues, etc. once they're frozen, you, even if you unfreeze them, they're no good. You, you know, you've damaged them forever. So, but they're hoping that, you know, in decades to come, they will find a process to, de to defrost them and, and then they can, you know, come back to life somehow or whatever. And you can actually just get your head frozen for about $80,000 <laughs> because they reckon that's all you need. Uh, you know, that's where, you know, the center of, you know, thoughts are and everything. And so then, you know, when they unfrost, defrost you, you can have some sort of a digital sort of experience after that, you know, you know, put on your um, Apple glasses or whatever they might have. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, I think, you know, it's becoming clear to me that not knowing, not believing what the Bible says is really is priming people in the world of all faiths, of all walks, etc. It's priming them for deception in the end time. Would you, wouldn't you agree with that? And, uh, and, and I imagine that some of these people that just have no faith, well, when they see paranormal things happening, miracles, etc., they may well be drawn to, to that sort of thing as well. And then, you know, I thought I'd throw this one here, cults. <laughs> Uh, there's, you know, cults all over the world. Uh, cults generally have some sort of a leader that is a, quite a charismatic, spiritual sort of person and offers answers to uh, people's questions in life, etc. But uh, oftentimes ends in tragedy, doesn't it? Um, here in Sydney, I forget now whether it was the 1980s or the 1990s, there was a group here in Sydney. Uh, one night they were out... Um, uh, waiting down there on George Street, I think, with their suitcases. And they believed that there was, you know, they were going to get beamed up uh, on a particular night. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, people believe all sorts of things, don't they? Uh, so coming back now to Christianity, because, you know, we believe in the Bible, but do you think the devil would cause some confusion about the Bible as well? Yeah, of course. And so if we look at our uh, Catholic friends, uh, you know, the second coming isn't even on their radar. Um, they've essentially adopted theistic evolution, so they believe that the world is progressively going to get better and better and better. Okay? Adventists don't believe that. We believe that the world will get, get more and more chaotic, and it will get to a point where, you know, enough is enough and Jesus will come back, Right? Uh, and so because they believe it's going to get better and better, they're not really too, con too concerned about when Jesus is going to come back or even if he's going to come back. Uh, they do believe that, yeah, it will happen one day, but it might be, you know, might be another thousand years, you know. Um, and of course, you know, having Pope, the, the, the Pope as Christ on earth, there's certainly no urgency to, to share a message that there's going to be, you know, Jesus coming back. What about our Protestant friends? Because, you know, we're part of the Protestant group. As Seventh-day Adventists, we would consider ourselves to be part of Protestantism. Uh, and, of course, there's different, um, different flavours, different colours of Protestantism out there. Uh, well, many Protestants today, more and more so, 
are believing in the secret rapture. How many of you have heard of the secret rapture? Hmm? Anyone not heard of the secret rapture? Half of you didn't put your hands up, guys. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> they believe that um, believers, there will come a point where believers will suddenly just be kind of beamed up, uh, raptured, so to speak, stealthily, if you like, taken from the earth. And um, years, years ago, uh, there was um, books written about this. Um, millions, as I put down there, made from the Left Behind series, a series of books that was written uh, by Tim LaHaye uh, about this secret rapture. They even made a movie about it. You know, millions of dollars made. And, and you know, in the movie, you've got an aeroplane flying and suddenly the pilots have been raptured. You know, so you've got a plane full of people with no, no pilot, etc. cetera. Uh, and so um, they believe that those that are left behind will then face a great hardship or time of tribulation before the actual literal second coming. And during that period of time, uh, people get a second chance, if you like, to accept Jesus. But, um, you know, the Bible says today is the day of salvation, right? Today. It doesn't say you know, do whatever you like now, because this, that's what this theory really does. It's like, well, it doesn't really matter what I do now. Um, you know, if I miss out on the secret rapture, yeah, I'll go through some hardship, but if I accept Christ, I'll be okay. It's like, you know, second chance theory. It's cool. And so it's really a false hope based on unscriptural uh, presumptions. So today, I just want to have a look at, you know, what does the Bible actually say? Well, first of all, I just want to jump through some, um, just quickly, some signs that precede the, uh, the second coming of Jesus. Um, first of all, we have, and I'm not, you know, uh, I, I could look at a dozen other sort of signs, if you like, that we could be looking at. But first of all, the Bible says that there will be wars and rumors of wars. And if you open up uh, the Bible, book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, talks a lot about, you know, the signs that will happen before Jesus' second coming. And, and so here in verse 6, Jesus says, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, you know, we have this war over in, the, in Europe right now between Russia and, and Ukraine. How many of us would have expected that to happen a couple of years ago? Uh, you know, we, it wasn't even on people's radar, was it? Um, and yet today, uh, Australia is throwing billions of dollars at getting ourselves armed up. Isn't that true? Uh, because they're talking about potential wars, wars and rumours of wars. Um, I'm not going to read all of those verses. I'm putting them up there in case people want extra verses on any of these things. But uh, the Bible talks of time of trouble, a time of great trouble, such as never was before. And uh, so certainly the world is not According to the Bible, it's not going to get better and better and better. It's going to get worse and worse and worse until a point where it gets so bad that according to Daniel 12, Jesus says, OK, enough is enough. He gets up and comes back. The next one there, also in Matthew 24, we have uh, lawlessness and distress of nations, etc. So we see again in Matthew chapter 24, we see in verse 12, and because of lawlessness... Uh, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. You know, uh, again, the last little while, we've seen lawlessness take on a whole new dimension, haven't we? Where even politicians, politicians of, of countries which should be taking a different path, take the law into their own hands and try and force things through. Isn't that true? It's not just the dictators anymore. It's this disease of lawlessness is spreading into what used to be what were free countries. And so, again, this is growing. Um, environmental issues and destruction. So if we go across to Luke chapter 21, um, we see there in uh, Luke chapter 21... 
verse 11. Uh, Jesus says here there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. There will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So uh, natural disasters, etc. People today call it climate change. Um, let's read a few more in here. We've got Revelation 11 verse 18 because this is a bit of a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? Where people talk about things that are changing in the world. So Revelation chapter 11 and uh, verse 18 says, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And I guess this is what a lot of the environmental movement is, is talking about today, isn't it? Uh, we're destroying the earth. Uh, we need to find another place to live because we're destroying the earth. Uh, but um, clearly, um, God's going to bring an end to that. God's going to bring, going to bring to an end to, uh, to those who uh, destroy the earth. If we look in Romans 8.22, uh, Romans 8.22 um, <clears throat> We see, therefore, we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. So, again, we see creation groaning at the seams, if you like, groaning, uh, you know, the tectonic plates, etc. We see the, uh, the um, animals, the, the, the flora and fauna uh, groaning under the conditions that we have in the world today. Then finally, if we come to the last one, the, oh no, I missed the, the false messiahs, the demonic confusions, etc. Coming back to um, uh, Matthew 24, then again, Jesus warns us. Um, he says, take heed that no one deceives you, right? He says, for many will come in my name. What does that mean? What are they saying? We're followers of Christ, right? We're followers of Jesus. Uh, and, but then they say, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And so um, many uh, will be confused, deceived before the end comes. And so the last one there on deceptions and miracles, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy here. <clears throat> 1 Timothy and uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Wow. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, um, so people are essentially have been deceived here into following the doctrines of demons. If we look in uh, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, which talks about the two beast powers uh, at the at time of the end there, we see that this second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in verse 12. Uh, in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And then it says he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wow. And then it says, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Deceptions and miracles. How is that all going to work? I wasn't planning to talk about this here today, but another something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. Uh, but uh, I've seen a few little things popping up recently, and particularly I think some group there in Congress, wasn't it, recently, looking at the activities of UFOs. Have you seen that? They're talking about UFOs. Uh, and in, uh, I need to look into that some more. But, you know, uh, alarm bells go on for me because I know that in Revelation it talks about this threefold union, right, at the end. And we know from 
from this book, right, the great controversy, that at the end, that there will be a union where Protestantism reaches across and joins hands with the Roman power, but it's when they also join this threefold union with demonic powers that then the last events will be, you know, will be dis on display. And I wonder, with all this technology today, wars and rumours of wars and development of more and more crazy weaponry, etc., I wonder whether this threefold union may have something to do with getting the upper hand in warfare. Because we know that there will be, this second beast is going to want to control the whole world, right? So I wonder whether that's got something to do with it. Anyway, this is the signs. I wasn't planning to spend so much time on the signs. I wanted to look at the manner of Jesus coming, okay? The manner. And... Uh, you know, many of our Protestant friends believe in this secret rapture. But the Bible says here in Matthew 24, again, Matthew 24, verse 27, that uh, it's not going to be a secret, right? Matthew 24, verse 27, it says, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. I mean, you can have your eyes closed. And you will see lightning. Isn't that true? Uh, inside. <laughs> uh, so it's not going to be any secret. In Acts um, chapter 1, we read there in verses 9 and 10, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And by the way, um, in the Bible, uh, like in the Psalms, uh, it refers to clouds of angels. And so it was the angels that were ushering the Lord back into heaven. Um, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So, so that's why you know, Jesus will come back in the same way. And that's why uh, Matthew 25, verse 31, uh, Jesus said that he will come with all the holy angels. How many? All of them. Any, any of them staying back in heaven? No. They're all coming back with Jesus, right? And then Revelation 1, verse 7. How could this be a secret when it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Uh, and so uh, certainly no secret. Matthew 24, verse 30 says, He comes with power and great glory. Okay, does that sound like a secret? No. Uh, and uh, when we look at what happens around that time when he comes, Revelation chapter 19 talks about the uh, second coming, but then Revelation 20 uh, gives us details about what happens after the time of the thousand years, the millennium, etc. And uh, it says that at this time, this is the first resurrection. So when Jesus comes back, you've got the first resurrection, right? And then it says the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished, all right? And so, um, so when Jesus comes back, there's a resurrection, right? The first resurrection. And uh, the book of Thessalonians, Paul uh, tells us what happens at that time in... Um, Thessalonians, Whoop, got stuff falling out of my Bible here, Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 verses uh, 13 to 18, it says, but I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, 
God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Meaning nobody gets to heaven before other people, right? Why? Because it's going to be a together experience at the second coming at the time of the resurrection. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is the first resurrection that Revelation talks about. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So that's the manner of Jesus' second coming. When Jesus comes, it'll be seen by everybody. It won't be a secret. Uh, it'll be loud. It'll be visual. Graves will be opening. People will be popping up. <laughs> and then we go up together. All right? A together experience received in the clouds, meaning what? Yes, there's clouds up there, but the angels will be there. All the holy angels will be there to receive you into heaven. Is that good news? So uh, this is the manner of Jesus' second coming that the Bible speaks about. And I guess the question is, you know, does it really matter? Does it really matter what you believe about the second coming? And I think it does matter because many times the Bible tells us that we need to watch and be ready. Don't be deceived, Jesus says, all right? Take heed there in Luke 21, verse 8. Take heed and do not be deceived. Why? Well, as we saw earlier, we looked at at least half a dozen of different things that people are waiting for out there, right? People are attempting different things. People are, 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 are concerned, definitely. People are concerned about the situation in the world and they're expecting a messianic figure to come. But Jesus is saying there's going to be lots of messianic figures that are false, that will deceive you. Okay? And so Paul writes here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13, 14, Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we can expect a lot of deception. That's why it's important that we know the scriptures, right? Paul also writes here, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 and 4, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Um, he's writing to the Corinthians here. Uh, however, the message is no different for us today, is it? Uh, the message is simple in the Bible. Uh, humans tend to complicate it and bring in other things that uh, are outside of the Bible, not biblical. And, of course, John writes about Babylon or confusion in the times of the end. And he writes there in chapter 18, verses 22 to 24, he says, For by your sorcery, what is sorcery? It's demonic activity, right? By your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. So clearly, this is something that we need to be watchful of. This is something, you know, as Adventists, this is in our name. Seventh-day Adventist, right? We're, we're, we're awaiting the Advent. And uh, we've always been preaching in the same way in regards to the manner of Christ coming. When he comes, he's not going to be walking around on this earth teaching about some sort of new law or, you know, uh, new way to peace and, and harmony, etc. No, Jesus is going to be up there and the believers are going to be caught up and taken to heaven to be with him for a thousand years. All right? So if you see some person walking on the earth, somebody on Foxtel, that's not Jesus. All right? Does it really matter? Well, in the end, the message of the Bible is that God is love. Right? And so at the second coming, in Revelation 8, verse 1, this is the, the last of the seals, the seventh seal is open, and it says there was silence in heaven. Silence in heaven. Why is there silence in heaven? 
I think it's because they're all coming here. All the holy angels, Jesus is coming, the Holy Spirit's already here. I reckon the Father's coming too. There's silence in heaven. This is a big thing. And this is how much God loves you. He's going to leave the place empty and come here to pick you up. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's just another way of God showing how much he loves you. Um, in Psalm 50 verse 3, it says, Everyone from heaven comes to the earth. Uh, sorry, it says, Our God shall come and shall not be silent. There'll be silence in heaven, but there won't be any silence here. Right? Why? Because everyone, like I said, everyone, the holy angels, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they're all here to pick us up uh, at that time of the second coming. Now, what else happens at that time? Um, in uh, Revelation 19, 15, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, uh, we understand that when Jesus comes back, those who are saved are caught up to meet him in the air. But those who are lost, the Bible says, are slain, right? Uh, in Revelation, it says, by the word that proceeds from his mouth, by the sword, the word that proceeds from his mouth, and by the brightness of his coming in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Uh, and so um, God is love. Those who are slain are not then subject to some sort of eternally burning hell. It says the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So they await the end of the thousand years and then there will be the final judgment. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, we read that already, how the righteous will meet the Lord in the air. I mean, what a wonderful experience being together with those who are close to us. Um, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, nobody today is in purgatory, being cleaned up, uh, being, you know, made right for heaven. Uh, you're either going to be there or you're not going to be there. All right. And, uh, and so the good news is that the righteous are then raised incorruptible. And uh, it's a together experience as we go up. Um, Almost 2,000 years ago, there was warning signs over Pompeii. This is a picture I took uh, of Pompeii some probably five, six years ago. Um, that's Mount Vesuvius there in the background with the clouds swirling around it. Thankfully, no smoke coming out. It looks like smoke, doesn't it? Uh, but 17 years before the eruption happened, uh, there were warning signs. There was an earthquake, the mountain began to rumble, etc., and smoke, etc. The warning signs were ignored and the people perished. Today, we have many warning signs all around us, right? They're screaming out at us, the warning signs. Jesus is coming back. And uh, I guess I've shown some of these things in the, in the uh, message earlier so that we're aware of some of the deceptions that are out there. There's going to be a lot more deceptions, but those deceptions will get bigger and bigger and stronger as we get closer to the second coming. And that's why it's important to know the real deal so that when you see the false deal, you know that it's false. You don't get swept up in it, whether it be some sort of a, uh, you know, an offshoot sort of wacky sort of movement or, um, or whether uh, there, there be miracles and uh, amazing supernatural paranormal things happening around some movement, if it's not according to the word, it's not from God. Okay, so the message that we've been given is do not be deceived. Be ready, but do not be deceived. You know, um, some of you would have heard of the Elijah message. Elijah had a message when, seven, eight hundred years BC. Uh, he had a message there for Israel to bring them back to the true God, back to the true faith, 
Then when uh, John the Baptist came on the scene, he had a message as well, didn't he? Making straight the path for, for the Lord, for the first coming of the Lord. Uh, and then uh, Jesus said, yes, there was Elijah, but, you know, Elijah here is here among you. And he made it plain that that was John the Baptist, the message of John the Baptist. But, he, but the Bible also speaks about the Elijah to come. And the Elijah to come is a similar sort of message. We get that message in Revelation 14, a call back to the creator God, a call back to worship in truth, etc. And in Revelation 18, there's the fourth angel's message, which says, come out of her, my people. This is God's last message for, for the people. And the question for us is today, you know, we see the signs around us. We see what's written in the scripture. Uh, the question for us is, are we listening? Are we ready? And uh, Kessie, I'd like if you could just give out those, uh, those things now. Uh, I'm not sure who else Kessie had to help her. It's Brenda, okay? Brenda and Kessie have some, uh, some cards and some pencils there. I want, you know, it's always good to, to make a decision. How many of you would like to be ready? for the second coming of Jesus, yeah? I think all of us would like to be ready, right? If I ask the question, how many of you are ready? I may not see so many hands, but I don't, I don't want to ask that question. But I think we all would like to be ready. And so it's always good to make that decision for Jesus when we're given the opportunity and uh, you'll see here on this card, if you could, when you get the card, if you could just check off, you know, put a tick or an X or something, some sort of mark there, as we'll soon be doing when we go voting. Oh, no, you can't put a mark. You have to write yes or no, I think, in the referendum, isn't it? No mark. Yes, it's a yes or a no. But you can put yes or no next to my questions here too. <laughs> so the first one here is, uh, I desire the Lord to give me wisdom and discernment for the end times. I think we all need wisdom and discernment because um, the scriptures say even the elect, right? That even the elect might be deceived. So we need to be careful. We need to be aware. And uh, one of the things that I have in here as an offer to you, in this book, The Great Controversy, last time I offered this, I was talking about a very different topic and different chapters but towards the end of this book, it talks about, this, this is the title of the chapters, okay? It says, the impending conflict. Then the next chapter is, the scriptures are a safeguard for us, okay? So that we're not deceived. The scriptures are a safeguard. Then there's the final warning. And I guess that might have... Uh, Elijah's message included in that final warning right because it's a global warning to the people uh, and then there is the time of trouble which we know is coming and finally God's people delivered uh, and so uh, I think that's question number four on this card here if you would like a copy of this book just make sure that you check that off and uh, put your details on there so that I can get it to you uh, question two is, I would like to be ready for the second coming. That's the, that's the question I just asked earlier. Uh, number three, I wish to be baptised like Jesus was. Some of you may have never been baptised. In order to be ready, uh, you know, John the Baptist, when he was preparing people for Jesus and for his message, what was he doing? He was saying, repent and be baptised. And it's the same today. The message is the same today. Repent and be baptized in order to be ready for the second coming of Jesus. Uh, number four is the offer of the book, if you would like this book. And number five is, I need prayer. Please pray for me. So if you have a particular prayer request, uh, there's the whole back of the page here. You can write the details on there, and we will make sure that we pray for you. All right? Let me close with a word of prayer before we sing our song, final hymn. And then if I could have the ladies go up, uh, go around and pick up those papers afterwards. Thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you for the good news. The good news that we can all be there on that day. On that great day 
a great glorious day when you come back. It is really something to look forward in a, in a world that is really in a mess at the moment. Lord, we know that there will be many deceptions out there. We know that they will be strong deceptions. And we know that there are deceptions even now, that much of the world is caught up in apathy or deception or just on a totally different trajectory. We pray, Lord, that this great message that you've given us to be ready will be burning in our hearts in a way that we can be blessed, our families can be blessed, and our friends and those who we interact with can also be blessed as a result of our infectious faith that we have in the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, and we pray that you'll bless us and our families today. In Jesus' name, amen.